So I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is uh, the March 24th, 2020 meeting of the Common Council. It is now 7.09 p.m. And we are having this meeting virtually. It appears that uh, I see Adam in the council chambers and uh, likely Can uh, Jody. Uh, Candace, are you in the council chambers too or are you at home? I'm at home. Okay. So we'll start, Candace, with roll call. Eileen Nichols? Here. Barbara Stockhausen? Here. Jason Arts? Here. Barbara Doss? Here. Ken Killian? Here. Robin Klein? Here. Isaac Shanley? Here. Okay. And as we start this meeting, I want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, this is extraordinary times, and uh, this is, in fact, an extraordinary meeting. So thank you to everybody. Right. And in that this is going to be posted on the web eventually, and some people may be listening in, I also want to say thank you to Platteville. I'm sorry I choked up. Hmm. All right, let's go on with the public hearing. And we, we will start, I believe if I can find Joe, uh, we'll start with you, Joe, which, if I can find you, Joe. Uh, it's too bad these don't come in alphabetical order. He's Joe's planning iPad. It's Joe, yeah, oh, there he is. Okay, Joe, I think I, unmute yourself. All right. Got it. Okay. All right. So the first request is a conditional use permit for a property at 170 South Chestnut Street. It's submitted by the First English Lutheran Church. So the church itself is located at 15 West Pine Street, um, but they also own uh, the property immediately to the south of them, which is 170 South Chestnut Street. Uh, for the most part, at least since I've been here uh, until recently, the property was a group home. Um, the church bought it a few years ago, and they've, it's been used as a single-family home since then for a couple of emergency family situations that needed some housing. Um, but their intent is to use it for some additional church-related activities. So primarily, they have a Lutheran campus ministry that's operated out of the church for many years. They would like to uh, use that for more of those types of activities with the UWP student group. So they would still have some residential use in the building, but they would also have uh, office space for that group, some meeting rooms for a variety of church-related activities, um, child care, food pantry, general meeting space, knitting groups, you name it, anything that the church has for an activity that they need some additional overflow space, they'd like to have the ability to put it in that building. Um, so they aren't really looking at making any physical changes to the property or the structure other than They'd like to add a, a four foot by five foot sign in the front yard just so people can find the property if they're looking for it. Um, it's right next to the church parking lot, so there is parking available for the activities that would uh, go on in that building. So otherwise, as I mentioned, no other physical changes that they foresee making at this time. So um, staff would recommend approval uh, of that use. Uh, the Planning Commission did consider it at their March 2nd meeting, and they also recommended approval. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, I'll ask through uh, Jason any questions of uh, Joe? Um, I have no questions. Eileen, any questions? No questions. Uh, Ken, any questions of Joe? Um, what was your comment about residential use? Residential use. So they would still like to have some residential use in there. Some of the uh, UWP students um, that are in that campus ministry have had expressed a desire to have some uh, some residents in there. Basically, part of it would be like an apartment. So that part would continue. Um, it's a very big structure, so they can kind of have the upstairs be the residence and the back part of the downstairs be the office and meeting room areas. I think it has seven bedrooms, I believe. Seven bedrooms? That could be. Well, we'll have how, uh, uh, we'll, we'll find that out in a minute. Uh, any other questions, Ken, than that? No, that's it. Okay, any questions, Barb? None. 
Any questions, Robin? No. And did I get every, any questions, Isaac? No. Okay. Um, then we'll move on to the applicant statement. Uh, Verge Pufa, I think that you're on the phone and we could see you. And I believe that you are the uh, representing the applicant, correct? That's correct. Okay. Do you have anything that you would like to add? Ken asked the number of bedrooms. There's seven bedrooms in there. Okay. Three baths, seven bedrooms. Okay. All right. Um, uh, we can go through again. Jason, any questions of the applicant? Um, no. Eileen? No. Okay. Ken, any more questions of the applicant? No questions. Isaac? No questions. Uh, Robin? No question. And Barb Stockhausen? My question is, is it ADA accessible? Um, <laughs> no, probably not. There are steps from the front and also steps from the side. So at present, I would say no. There's also a rear entrance, but you got to go down steps to get to it. So I would say no. Is there plans in the future to change that? Uh, I guess it would depend upon the uses the church would make of it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Virgil. Uh, then I think we're done with the applicant statement. Now we would take any public statements in favor. So I'm not sure how to do that. Um, if you, let's see, can some of you write, is there anybody... Is there any, I've un, I think I've unmuted everybody. Is there anybody here to speak on this topic? If so, please identify yourself. Barb, this is Greg Siegman. Okay. So I was, I was at, the, at the, uh, the other meeting and afterwards, the neighbors on both the south side and the west side, you know, expressed their appreciation on what might go forward they were they were happy with what we were talking about okay good so we'll call that a public statement in favor anybody else that has any other public statement in favor <coughs> uh, mr seekman can you please state your address 6725 north elm thank you sorry but thanks, okay. Candace, for that reminder. <laughs> why isn't the, why, I'm sorry, why isn't the, do the regular campus housing have to be ADA compliant? I don't know. Uh, this is not campus housing. So it would not have to be ADA. Uh, campus housing probably would, but this isn't campus housing. Right. This is a property owned by uh, First English Lutheran Church of Platte. All right, let's take any public statements again and again. I think I've unmuted everybody. Then uh, I assume there are no public statements in general. Uh, council discussion. Barb, any further questions or comments? No, thank you. Okay, Robin? Just on that subject of ADA, does a church have to be ADA compliant on all properties? Joe? Um, I, I'm not an expert on that, especially with churches, but the general rule with ADA on commercial type buildings is if they do any major remodeling projects, they have to spend a certain percentage of the cost of that project on accessibility improvements. That's usually how they try to bring older buildings into compliance over a period of time. But it's basically a percentage of the cost. In this case, they're not doing any improvements, so they would not be legally oh, required to do any improvements. Okay. okay, Robin, does that answer your question? Yeah. Isaac, do you have any? I have, yeah, I do have one question. Dean, it's going to be a multi-use, single family, or not single family, but a residential, then slash some type of commercial. Is there any difference with the building and fire codes for fire separation? Um, no, nothing that would require because it's not physically a, a separate unit. It's just, uh, residential as part of the structure, but they don't have the separation of 
um, utilities okay. and so forth. Okay. Any other questions, Isaac? Nope, that's it. Okay, Jason? Uh, no questions. Okay, Eileen? No questions. Oh, I would have a lot more questions if I was on this council right now. And Ken, any other questions? No question. Okay, then I don't think we have, I think we've answered <coughs> all the questions. If we're ready for the end of council discussion, I would take a motion to close the public hearing. I, I would move to close the public vote. hearing. Okay, second. I have a motion and a second. It would be Eileen uh, and Isaac. And Candace, you can make that any way you want. I knew this would be a more difficult thing, the, the motions and the uh, closing. So you can that place close doesn't the, have to become uh, ADA to close the public hearing. It's a huge building, seven Which, bedrooms, three bathrooms. Uh, I don't know who's talking, but. There's, uh, yeah, there's somebody. I think I'm going to have to mute everybody again. It was the one labeled Jeff. It was the one called Jeff. All right. Uh, Candace, we're ready to vote. All right, I'm closing the public hearing. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Yeah. Stanley? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, and do I hear anybody on the council who is willing to make a motion? Um, I'll move. I move to approve a conditional use permit to allow the First English Lutheran Church to conduct various church related activities on the property at 170 South Chestnut Street as proposed. Okay, do I hear a second to Mr. Killian's motion? I'll second. second. All right, Barb Stockhausen, I believe that was your voice I heard. So we have a motion by Ken and a second by Barb to approve uh, this conditional use permit for First English Lutheran Church. Candace, we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, Verge, if you want to stay on, you can, but you don't have to feel you have to. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, council persons. All right. Bye-bye. Well, we'll Goodbye. move on to the second public hearing then, which is resolution 20-06. This is Alliant Energy's request for 1295 Southwest Road. And um, so we'll start with you. Yeah, so Alliant Energy operates the uh, Pioneer electrical substation on that property on Southwest Road. So they have uh, the equipment on that uh, property is getting, getting to the, to the end, end of its lifespan. So they'd like to make some upgrades to that facility. Um, they haven't had any flooding issues yet, but they have had some significant erosion issues around the edge of the property. So as part of the project, they'd also like to make some improvements to address that issue. So basically what they're going to do is raise the entire property up three to four feet. So it would be more in line with where the driveway comes off of Southwest Road instead of dropping down. Um, so that'll get it above uh, the floodplain issues that may come up in the future. And they'll regrade uh, the area around the substation itself to provide better drainage in that area. Uh, the actual pad where the equipment will be located will be expanded by approximately 1,800 square feet. Um, and then obviously they will provide new equipment uh, within that area, new fence surrounding the equipment. Um, so the total disturbed area will be just over a half acre uh, for that project. Um, but it does uh, raise the property above the flood stage so they won't have to worry about that going forward in the future. Um, other than that, obviously, it's still going to be remain uh, electrical substation, so the overall use is not going to be uh, different than what it is now. Um, staff does recommend approval. Uh, the Planning Commission considered it at their March 2nd meeting and also recommended approval. Any questions? Okay, Jason, <laughs> questions? Uh, no questions. 
Robin, questions? No questions. Eileen, questions? I do not have any questions. Isaac, questions? No questions. Uh, uh, Ken, questions? I asked at the last meeting the um, height of the substation in relation to the floodway. Did they come up with that at all? How much above the floodway is it going to be? You talk about the flood plain. Uh, what about uh, the floodway itself? They're very so, close to Round Tree Branch. Yeah, the, the, the property right now is not located in the floodway. It's located in the flood fringe. So that means it's not in the area that would have moving water. It would be kind of water off to the side that's pushed off the side. So when they do the design, they have to make sure that it doesn't create an impediment for the movable of water. So it doesn't create a dam, so to speak, and that it cannot be in a situation when it raises the flood stage for any surrounding property in that area. So um, that design was done with those two main criteria uh, according to our ordinance, so it is in full compliance. I believe, I don't remember the number, but my memory says that it's uh, going to be two feet above uh, the flood level, is what my memory says. But I can look that up. I do have the, two, the study two feet here. Above. What is the two feet above? The base of the substation? The ground level? The, the flood elevation. Well, what I'm asking you here is uh, the the base of the substation, is that two feet above the flood level? I, I will have to find that out, but I believe the end result will be two feet. After the filling, it'll be two feet above flood stage. Well, the reason I ask is because the last few years have been getting higher and higher amounts of water so that uh, Myself, I could see times when it could be very high down in that area. So that's why I asked the question. And my other question right. last week was, uh, if the station is flooded, uh, what are the effects? Is there any effect as far as uh, loss of electricity? And, and Ken, and perhaps we'll question. have, maybe Greg, when he speaks as the applicant, can answer a couple of those questions. So let me ask Barb, do you have any questions of Joe, Barb Stockhausen? No, I don't. Okay, then we'll move on uh, to uh, the applicant statement. So Greg, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And you speak on behalf of Alliant. Would you introduce yourself and please give your address so that we can record that? Greg Ardry, manager of substation operations and construction. And it is 4902 North Biltmore Lane, Madison, Wisconsin. Okay. And perhaps you can address some of the questions that Mr. Killian had. So yeah, I can get to those and just to understand kind of in the bigger picture of all the what we've done here. As we go back a couple of years, we added a substation, at least our facilities, to the American Transmission Company substation out on um, Highway 80. And that was to be able to bag up this particular station if something were to happen. So if something were to happen at this station, we already have bag up in place. That was the benefit of doing that. Um, when we start talking about our construction, our lowest point will be two feet above the 100 foot or the 100 year flood level. Well, that is our lowest point on any spot in that particular substation. Then our equipment itself will be, the, well, our biggest piece of our switchgear building will be set out of the side, probably another three feet. Um, all of the electrical components will be two to three feet above even that two foot level. So we'll be four to five feet above that hundred year flood level. Um, so we were factoring some of that in because we have had some erosion and flood issues. Fortunately, none that has affected the electricity. Um, so that's what we're planning. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Uh, council people, questions for Mr. for Greg. Robin? 
Any uh, questions? No questions. Jason? Uh, no questions. Eileen? No questions. Isaac? No questions. Barb? None. No question. Ken, any more questions? No further questions. Okay. So that should uh, wrap up for this public hearing, the staff presentation and the applicant statement. We would now move on to public statements in favor. Uh, so again, I guess I will unmute all. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of the permit for Alliant Energy? Okay, no one has responded to that. Is there anyone among oh, us God. who is here to speak against this conditional use permit for Alliant Energy? Is there anyone here at all who wishes to talk about <laughs> this in a general way? Okay, uh, council people, Robin, any further questions, comments? No. Nope. Jason? No. Eileen? No. Ken? No. Oh. Barb? None. Isaac? No. Okay, I'll take a motion to close the public hearing. I move I'll to close the public hearing. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, a motion by Ken, a second by Isaac to close the public hearing. Candace will vote. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Motion okay, carries. Motion passes. Thank you, Greg, for attending, and you're welcome to stay or you're welcome to leave. <laughs> However you feel. Thank okay. you very much and have a good night. All right. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the approval or consideration of the consent calendar. And tonight on the consent calendar, we have payment of bills. We have appointments to boards and commissions. I have none. We have- Did we approve the uh, conditional use? Yes. Did we say a motion? <coughs> you closed the public hearing, but you didn't vote on it. You oh, to vote okay. On it. Thank you, Joe. Somebody needs to tell me that. We closed the public hearing. Okay. Common Council action on the resolution. Do we have a um, motion on the resolution? I, I would move to approve the conditional use permit. Okay. To allow the expansion and rebuild of Pioneer substation at 1295 Southwest Road. Okay, we have a motion and I believe second. I heard Eileen have a second. Second, yes. Okay, Candace, now we'll vote on that. Sorry. That's all right, Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Ken? Did you call my name? Yes. Killian, yes. Uh, Klein? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Now, <laughs> I'll try the consent calendar. So on the consent calendar tonight, we have the payment of bills. We have appointments to boards and commissions. I have none. We have several licenses for the museum uh, for to sell fermented malt beverages at uh, events uh, beginning as early as April 16th and extending through December 3rd. Thank you, Eric, for getting those in early. We have one and two year operator licenses as were detailed. And then we also put in here the City of Platteville emergency declaration for the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. So um, these items can be approved on one single motion, or if you want anything pulled, you need to say that now. So, Council, what is your privilege? I move to approve all items listed under consent calendar. Second. We have a motion by Barb Stockhausen, a second by Robin Klein to approve the consent calendar as presented. We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Hanley? Yes. Motion carries. 
Okay. The next item on our agenda is the one that I've struggled with how I even am going to do this, but uh, the this is citizens comments, observations, and petitions, if any. And I believe that I will first call on Kayla. Kayla, are you still here? Yep, I'm still here. Okay. Kayla, would you state your name and then your address? And then again, start with what you wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, I'm Kayla Golden. I live on 330 Jewett Street. Um, I've been working on setting up some sort of mutual aid network in the Platteville area. And at this point, um, I've generated some volunteers. I haven't found anybody in need of help yet, but um, I'm just trying to make connections with local organizations to figure out what we can set up, um, figure out what people in this community need. Um, I have a website that I've sent to all of you at this point or all the council members. Um, I'm trying to send that around. But yeah, if people have ideas or suggestions or anything like that, I would love to hear that here. And, and Kayla, I did put you in contact with John Meitinger, our Senior Center Director. Yep, I've been talking to him a little bit. And also with Ela Kakaday at the Platteville Industrial Development Corporation, who seems to have some information about childcare. Yes, um, I haven't really contacted her much yet, but I'm working on that. Okay. So do you have a web address or anything you want to share? Yeah, so I can just read it to people, um, but I also emailed it to you guys. Um, it's sites.google.com slash view slash plat, so P-L-A-T-T dash COVID-19, and that's just C-O-V-I-D-1-9, and then dash collective care, spelled C-O-L-L-E-C-T-I-V-E-C-A-R-E. -E -E. So if you go to that, you can find the forms and stuff to help volunteer or request assistance or get information, that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. There were, there are other people on the call tonight and I don't know if uh, there are others that want to talk. So Ben, I'm going to unmute you. Did you have any update that you wanted to provide us? Yes, I do. Um, so as you know, COVID-19 has been sweeping the nation, um, as well as our university. So um, our, we have complete online classes um, from now until the end of the semester, um, as, do, as, um, as following suit with the majority of the of universities, especially within our system. Um, and some information of the chancellor has announced that commencement is postponed. It's not canceled um, at the moment, but uh, it is announced that was postponed um, to a later date. Um, and the UW system put, put out a statement, uh, Ray Cross, the system president put out a statement saying that all students will be pro -rate, have a prorated refund of their meals and dining, um, as well as their housing. Um, so right now, uh, the director of residence life, Linda Milroy Bowden, is, is going through that, figuring out how that's gonna, how that's gonna work, how that's gonna play into effect. Um, but all UW system students um, will have prorated refunds on their meals, dining, um, and our residence halls. Um, as she mentioned, you know this will take time. Um, it's not a, it's not an easy easy process. So, um, but that that will be coming for the students, um, as well as um, at, in a while uh, we plan on setting up a team. Um, we being the university plan on setting up a team uh, to deal with the long-term effects of COVID-19, um, both budgetary um, and, and other effects. Um, EOC, our Emergency Operations Commission, that continues to meet daily um, and continues to inform uh, the students and, and any other stakeholders within that. Um, as well as uh, Student Senate today, uh, myself and Kirsten, um, we, we wrote a letter to send up to um, our senators. So um, our senators at the federal level, so Tammy Baldwin and Ron Johnson, um, and will probably be sent to Ron Kind as well in support of the stimulus package um, that's being sent through. 
um, and still being talked about. There's finally more language in there about universities um, and how universities, how there's gonna be uh, funding and extra support going to universities. Um, and as well as the president, Ray Cross, uh, sent, sent some of the things that they, that they wanna see, um, things like institutional aid to help um, with the reimbursement of students, um, as well as waivers to um, free up some of those fees um, that are locked in by regulation. Um, just to help benefit students. So um, those are the main things that are happening on our campus. Um, um, all events, all performances, all sports, anything like that, those are all canceled between now and the end of the semester. So um, that's pretty much on our end. Are there any questions? All right, thank you. Thanks, Ben. And uh, just so everyone knows, Ben has joined uh, the city uh, staff. Uh, I saw him with Adam the other day oh. as an intern. So uh, you'll see Ben around. Uh, Christina, I can't unmute you. You would have to unmute yourself. Did you want to uh, say anything at this time? No, nope, no official updates. No official updates. Okay. I have sent a bunch you, of messages. Go ahead. Madam, Madam Chair, yes. uh, what was her? Uh, her uh, point of reference. Christina? I'm sorry. Oh, Pardon I'm, me? Christina. I'm Christina yes. Cruz at 1490 Deborah Court, and I serve as the university's EOC liaison to the city. Okay, thank you. I didn't catch that before. Okay, and I there are several people on here. So as people have been presenting, I wanted you to know that I've been reaching out to them. And we have a couple of students here who are observing this as a public meeting. So uh, Chris uh, Stein, welcome. And Danielle, it appears you're also appearing this as a public meeting. Uh, and uh, another one that's just watching to see what Zoom is all about. And then finally, I see somebody who's going to want to talk perhaps during our discussion about the uh, uh, developer's agreement uh, between the uh, city and the school district. So I believe that's it for citizens, comments, observations, and petitions, if any. I'm hoping I did not miss anybody. If I did, I truly apologize. Uh, we'll get this down. We'll figure, we'll figure a better way eventually, but this is, <laughs> this is our first time at this. Let's move on. There were several reports in your package. Uh, the airport commission was one of those. I have nothing more to report. Barb, the museum board was one. Nothing, yeah, nothing to report. And Isaac, the Plaville Transportation Committee. Nothing to report. Okay. And we'll move into the action part of our action portion of our agenda. So the action portion, the first one is resolution 2007. And this is uh, the um, one to um, terminate the tax increment finance district. And Nicola? I'm here. There you go. I okay. Cool, right? um, so we've looked at uh, the staff notes a couple of different meetings now. We were waiting to see if there would be any action taken on some proposed uh, legislation at the state level. Uh, more recently, we were waiting to see what might happen actually today at a scheduled Senate floor session. Um, however, with the outbreak of COVID-19, that floor session was postponed and the deadline for this um, termination is April 15th. So staff is recommending that um, the resolution be approved to terminate tax incremental finance in district number four. Okay, so we have talked about this before, probably beginning two months ago. So um, I'm going to go around by council person again to ask if there's any questions. Barb, do you have any questions on oh, this termination? Pardon? I do not have any more questions. Okay, Isaac, do you have any questions on this termination? No questions. Robin? No questions. Uh, Jason? No questions. Uh, Eileen? No questions. And Ken? No questions. No questions. Okay. If there are no questions on this uh, particular item, 
Are we then ready to take action on it? And if so, could somebody offer a motion? I'd make a, I'd make a motion to approve resolution number 20-07 to terminate the tax incremental financing district number four. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Isaac and a second by Eileen to, to approve this resolution 20-07. Uh, Candace will vote. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Gillian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next we have development agreement with the Platteville School District, Lot 21 of the Oak Haven subdivision. And Joe, I think that's yours, right? Correct. Um, yeah, so the city does own a, a vacant lot in the uh, Oak Haven subdivision, Lot 21, which is at 250 Nolwood Way, I believe. Um, at the January 28th meeting, the council did agree and, and voted to donate that lot to the the Platteville School District. They would like to use that uh, for constructing a single family home. They'd like to expand their uh, trades uh, educational programs at the, the high school. So that would fit in great with their uh, goal of doing that. So the uh, at the meeting on the 28th, the council's vote was to donate it uh, subject to a development agreement. So we have uh, drafted a, a development agreement for your consideration. Um, it basically, it's pretty straightforward, it just says the city will donate it. Um, and then there are some conditions that the school district, district would have to meet. Um, obviously maintaining the property and using it for the construction of the home. Um, I wasn't at the last meeting, but my understanding there was some questions about the ADA requirements. I did revise it and I sent it out in the packet, but there was still some uh, questions about the language in there. So I, I made another revision to the exhibit A uh, that was emailed out today. I'm hoping everybody got that, but uh, basically the most recent revision just clarifies that uh, the ADA accessibility type improvements that were mentioned are um, recommendations and are not uh, requirements of the agreement. Um, otherwise, uh, one of the changes was there was a, a, a small statement added that the property is conveyed as is there's no guarantees as to the condition of the property or anything of that nature so um, I believe that took care of the questions that were raised at the last meeting um, given that um, staff would recommend approval any questions okay questions Barb up Joe I had sent an email in and mentioned that I felt the ADA rules should be encouraged that's just a comment and they are in in the in the exhibit a that's attached isaac any questions no uh, joe no nope. robin uh eileen no i would just add that i like the reason where it's uh, recommended or suggested that the ada um requirements be put into the home if at all possible or if okay. desired by the person who is buying it. Jason? Uh, no further questions. And Ken, any questions of Joe? <clears throat> My uh, council packet, uh, the draft is dated 318. And then Joe, you sent something out different this morning? That's correct. correct. And does it say something like the following recommendations instead? Uh, the, the change would be to Exhibit A, which is the last page of the document. Right. Um, so the, the, the new language says, although not a requirement, the school agrees to consider including features that allow improved accessibility and mobility for individuals with physical impairments, such as the following. So it makes it a, uh, something that they would consider doing, but not a requirement. Okay. So your, your email this morning uh, states that. Correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jim Babel, our superintendent of schools, is on our line tonight. And Jim, do uh, you have anything that you'd like to add? I just said I'm very comfortable with the changes that were made. And once the city council votes on this, I can then take it to my board. Okay. And uh, John Wilson, who is uh, probably cl currently muted, said, 
He's listening for information regarding Oak Haven project. We live in the Knollwood neighborhood. We are in favor of the project. We also received a letter regarding the property across the highway from us. And that was something that came up last night, John. Uh, that is not on the council agenda. It was on the extraterritorial board, extraterritorial board of zoning appeals. So the only thing we're considering tonight is the developer's agreement on this lot uh, at uh, lot 21 of the Oak Haven subdivision. So uh, Barb, one more round. Any questions of our superintendent, Mr. Babel? No, none today. Okay, Isaac, any no. questions? Robin? No questions. No. Uh, Jason? No. Eileen? No. And Ken, any questions of our superintendent? No questions. Okay, if we have discussed them, and uh, if no one has any further questions, do I hear anybody who would like to offer a motion on this particular agenda I'd, item? I would make a motion. I'd make a motion to approve the development agreement with the Platteville School District regarding the construction of a single family home located at lot number 21 of the Oak Haven subdivision with the updated exhibit A attachment. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Isaac and a second by Robin. Um, Candace will vote. Nichols? Nichols? Yes. Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Goss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. yes. Shanley? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, thank you for that. And, and Jim, again, you're willing to, you're more than welcome to stay, but uh, thank you for attending tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, item number C is a petition for the detachment of land. And Howard, I believe, is this, who's, is this Howard's? Uh, I, I can take this one. Okay. Um, so this was a petition that was submitted uh, by the property over owner, uh, Irv Lupe, uh, properties at 1525 and 1535 North Elm Street. So the, the properties are within the city limits now. They were actually annexed by the previous city manager, Lon Pluckon, years ago. Um, <clears throat> Irv has got the properties for sale and has had some difficulty with uh, that process. A lot of the people that have looked at the properties um, have had issues with the fact that the property, one of the properties is vacant and one of them has a house on it. Uh, in particular, the vacant property does not have access to uh, city utilities, even though it is in the city. Um, and getting access to the utilities would essentially require an easement be granted from one of the adjoining property owners. And that has been a, a less than straightforward process. So Mr. Lupe did go to the uh, Water and Sewer Commission with the request to allow uh, a, a private septic system to be installed in a well on the property. Um, they did decline, but they said they would be willing to reconsider, but they wanted him to make an attempt to see if the property could be de-annexed. Uh, yeah. If it's not part of the property, then their normal rules about not allowing uh, well and septic to be installed uh, within the uh, city property could be uh, would no longer apply. Um, so he has made that request for that reason. So this is basically driven by the issue of not having utilities to city utilities to this property, even though it is in the city. So okay. any questions regarding that? Are there questions of council members? Barb? <coughs> any questions, well, Barb? more like a recommendation that we consider this uh, this proposal. I know how difficult it is to find well and septic space. And I agree that it's difficult to get to this part of the land if you look at the map. So I would be in favor of considering this proposal. Well, that's what we're doing tonight. We're considering whether to do it or not. Okay, Isaac. Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, I'd be in favor, as, as Barb is, for considering this um, for a couple of reasons. 
number one beings that this property was only annexed into the city for the fact that the city manager at that time was required to live within city limits. Um, then the second comment that I would have is the fact that if we're not able to provide a city service, say water and sewer, um, I believe we should allow the property to be, say, unannexed or taken off the city tax roll so that the property can be sold and a well and septic be placed onto the property. So I would be in favor of this um, petition to remove the property from the city. Robin? Any questions of Joe? Sorry about that, no, no questions. Uh, Jason? So with, um, with it being the sewer and water, um, not having access to it, you would, uh, Joe, you had said that um, there's been discussion to potentially allow um, well to be done there, even though um, it would still, if it were to, to remain city property. Right, so my understanding is the, the Water and Sewer Commission um, basically agreed that they would reconsider that idea if the council did not allow the de-annexation of this property. So if, if this is not approved this evening, uh, essentially the property owner would go back to the Water and Sewer Commission, ask them to reconsider um, the original request to al allow them to put well and septic on the property, even though it's still in the city. Is there, um, is there enough room in the land to be able to do that? Uh, yeah, actually both of those properties are, are much larger than the normal city lot. Okay. I, don't, I don't know if they've had any testing or anything of that nature done yet to make sure they would um, meet those requirements, but they have plenty of space available. And besides sewer and water, um, are there any other like city, um, what am I trying to say, like city services that they're, that they're now getting um, or... Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question other than technically the, the, the streets that the, the, that portion of Elm Street that serves these lots is actually a town road. So, you know, the, the, the snow removal and um, street maintenance would actually fall under the township, not the city. Okay. I guess I was just asking because if they're paying city taxes, but they're not getting all of the services, then... I guess that would be something to consider. Eileen. Um, I echo some of the sentiments that have already been expressed, which is that I think that this is a property that um, there is great difficulty in trying to find a way to have water and sewer to that property, to the properties, and, and it would be a considerable cost. And it was only annexed because of uh, the rule at the time that a city manager had to live in the city. Ken. No questions. So this is my thought on this. I'm, I'm probably, and uh, uh, well, actually, Irv, uh, I see you're here. Uh, we should probably allow you to say anything you'd like to say. But, and then I don't have a question. Well, I do have a question, Joe. Do we know the amount of taxes paid on these lots into the city? Uh, that I do not know. Because Give me by, two seconds, by, I can find that out. Okay, by giving this property back to the township, we need to understand that we are, in fact, giving away money that we're collecting and that the people who are going to have to pay that money are all the rest of us. Because we collect a certain amount of tax and it's spread over the taxpayers, all the taxpayers that play, pay, and all the property. And if we de annex property, that means that we have less property. That means the people within the less property now have to pay more. And I don't know how much more that is, but it does mean that there's more to be paid. Is that correct, Adam? I can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's definitely the staff concern. And if you look in the staff note, that was the recommendation that I think staff has made is 
um, you know, the recommendation from staff would be to look at going to allowing in this instance on a case by case basis to allow them to pursue the well system because you know the general rule of thumb is we do not want to be annexing property from the city. So I think the key would be to look at whatever potential scenario we can do to help this property owner in meeting what they want to do by still being able to get, you know, the city benefits, which again, is they're considered a city resident. So a lot of the you know, programs and fees, they're paying the resident rate instead of a non-resident rate. So those are some things to consider. Um, you know, as future goes along, who knows what's going to be the decision with, you know, garbage and recycling or different things like that, that could be an advantage. Um, so I guess, you know, the recommendation I would consider is that we look at trying to do whatever we can to help the property owner in achieving, you know, if looking if they're looking to get a well and septic tank, let's look at making that, you know, if there's an exception that we can do to allow that. Okay, Irv, would you like to say anything? Um, the tax, I do have my tax bill from last year. Um, it's about $2,550 between both properties um, for the city portion. And um, do you have, go ahead. Total tax bill is $7,000 a year for both properties. Um, the only services that I have um, really received is once in a while I'll put leaves out on the street and the street department will come get them. Most of the time I take them myself. Um, and if I, if the police need to come, the police will come. Okay. Who, uh, plows the snow this it's in the town that the road is in the township really? so the road the that goes by is a, is a township road do they actually get there on any timely basis they do um it's it's normally well after the snowfall and um you know they, they get there on a, and on a daily basis when it snows Someone speak to that neighborhood in general, further down that road, what the potential of those properties being annexed might be, and is that sort of an age where a lot of those houses are looking at replacing their well and septic soon? Joe? Um, well, I was going to say there's only one other vacant property to the north that is in the township that would likely see some development. Otherwise, the land around there is already developed. Uh, I can't say that I'm that familiar with the neighborhood to know the age of the properties um, as far as the, the, you know, the likelihood that they'd have water and sewer problems. I really can't speak to that. Can anybody? I'm thinking it's like 90s, 80s, 90s. I don't know when that was developed, but it seems like those houses are probably about the time that they would be getting updates. And I don't know how long a well and septic lasts, a few decades? I don't know. <laughs> it depends on the soil property um, and how it was built, just like our water and sewer systems for the city. They could last, and, and nowadays, they, um, 15, 20 years ago, we started doing mandatory maintenance on septic systems. So the county keeps up with that uh, three-year maintenance program, inspection and pumping. So, Irv, you currently have a well and a septic system on the property where your house is. I do. <laughs> okay, so in my opinion, this is, this is my opinion. If we de-annex the land, Irv goes into the township, he puts in a well and septic. We lose the taxes, we lose that land. <laughs> if we don't de-annex the land, and we say, say to the Water and Sewer Commission, we think you should allow them to put this water and sewer, this well and sept again. We keep the land, we keep the taxes, and either way, whether he is de-annexed or annexed, he's putting in a well and septic system. <coughs> so I, I just really have an issue with reducing our tax base when we're working very hard to increase our tax base. So that's my opinion. And uh, if the sewer and water commission would say it's okay to, to do the, the well and septic is, would the property owner be on the hook for all of the costs or how does, how does that work? Yep. 
I think okay. it would be all the costs, Joe, right? That would be my understanding, yes. Yeah. And that would be the same if it became township land too then? Correct. That's right. Correct. Okay. So the cost to the person isn't going to be any different. Okay. The end result, since we can't get water and sewer, isn't going to be any different. The difference is going to be in the tax base in the city. The tax base that the property owner pays. The yeah. tax base, yes. And the fact that we're still going to have to collect however much tax that is. And instead of, you know, we're going to spread it back to, frankly, other people. And we're going to spread it over the property that's left. How's that? Uh, Barb, any other questions? Are there two houses, two homes on that property? There's two lots. One has a home on it, and one is a vacant lot. Is that correct? No. It is Our correct. It will go up. could very well go up with improvements. All right, uh, Isaac, any other questions? No, oh, but I, I do have a comment regarding the, to the one that you just commented about the keeping it into the city and all the, the costs going to the property owner. A, a typical city lot would have water and sewer available to that property, and that cost would the owner would have minimal cost to hook up to it. Where a case like this, he's going to have probably. Well, I'd say he's gonna have about seventeen thousand to twenty thousand dollars of his own money to put a well and septic in. Whereas yeah. if he was a city lot where the water and sewer there, he don't he would have a lot less than say a thousand dollars. So this is the issue I and I understand we should keep the tax base in, in the city, but this is another issue where if the city's not able to keep or produce those products as this one here would be a city water and sewer, maybe should look at allowing him to do this. So that's my only comments. Robin? I don't know if I feel clear on what the original request was by the property owner. Was it the preference to stay within the city or to be annexed? I think the original request at the uh, water and sewer, Joe, was to uh, put in, be allowed to put in a septic system and a well. And the water and sewer commission denied that. And so, and said, go to the council and see if you can get the land de-annexed. And if they don't de-annex it, then you can come back and ask us again. Did I recap that pretty good, Joe? That's my understanding. I was not at the meeting, though. Okay. That is correct. Okay. Herb says that's correct. <clears throat> so the original request was a request to put in water and sewer on the lot as it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jason, any further questions? Um, nothing right now, no. Because we're gonna we're gonna bring this to a close pretty soon here. Eileen, any further questions? No further questions. Uh Ken. No questions. And did I get everybody? One, two, three, four, five, six. I think I have everybody. Okay, so we have no further questions. So the question tonight is whether or not to allow the de-annexation of these two lots. Not one, just two? Correct. So he even wants to de-annex the one that he's already got water and sewer on. And he wants to also de-annex then the one that's vacant. So water and sewer as in well and septic. Right. He's got well and septic in one already. Right. Right. And when he purchased the land, he knew that. So. I'll make a motion. I'd make a motion to approve the request to detach the properties located at 1525 and 1535 North Elm Street from the city. We have a motion. I'll second it. And we have a second. Candace? Nichols? Yes. Dockhausen? Can you repeat? Did you say, Isaac, did you say deny? I said to approve. 
The motion. Yes. Arts? No. Doss? No. Gillian? No. Klein? No. Shanley? Yes. Motion does not carry. Okay, so Herb, I guess you go back to the Water and Sewer Commission or Joe, you send it back to the Water and Sewer Commission for uh, their consideration of a well and septic system on that second lot. <laughs> housing assistance program <clears throat> so and Nicola is that you or Adam nope that would be me Joe oh, oh. at least I'll start and anybody else can jump in if they so desire um, so we had talked about this uh, previously when we uh, when the council uh, approved uh, extending the life of TID 4 for one year to support affordable housing projects so during that process, the council kind of outlined the uh, the two programs that they would like to pursue in, in more detail. And both, basically those two programs were um, housing incentives in the form of loans to home buyers who purchased pre-1950s affordable houses, which are in need of re rehabilitation and grants for conversion of pre 1950 single family rentals back to affordable owner-occupied homes. So that was kind of the starting point. Um, so staff further developed uh, the details in how those programs could work, um, kind of the, the basic requirements and um, more of the details. So I do have a draft of the uh, uh, program project requirements and details uh, in your packet, as well as a couple of draft applications. Um, <clears throat> but basically the idea is that um, it would be for as proposed for single family homes. Uh, obviously they would have to be pre-1950 to get the older uh, housing stock that needs more work. Uh, to try to address the housing affordability part of it, which was the, the, re the reason that it was allowed to be used as a, a TIF extent was, uh, so to try to capture that, we, we have in here that the uh, properties would have to have an assessed value of $150,000 or less. Um, the, the properties would have to be owner occupied uh, as a condition of getting the funds. Uh, we, we do have it set up so somebody could flip a home. In other words, they could buy it, fix it up, and then try to resell it to somebody else. The person who did the, the flipping wouldn't have to live in it, but the person that they sell it to would have to. Um, so it's set up that it would be a, a owner, owner occupied restriction. Uh, for a minimum of five years if it's just a loan, 10 years if it's the grant. Um, we do have some ability for somebody who already lives in the house, say they just bought the uh, house, say this winter, and we in, in put this in place, um, they could still apply for the funds to help make some of the improvements. Um, they could also get approval prior to purchasing a home. Um, the idea is that it would be for uh, improvements to the structure itself, the principal structure, just the house, not a uh, detached garage or any site improvements. It would have to be actual improvements to the structure, uh, appliances or furniture, um, that type of thing would not qualify. Um, so basically they would have a specific uh, a, a project plan that they have proposed that would be submitted with cost estimates and the project would be approved based on that. Uh, but they would be set up as a reimbursement. So they would have to submit invoices, actually do the work. We would verify the work was, was completed as proposed before we actually get, give them the money. Um, and then we would have a development agreement to uh, kind of provide a little bit more security uh, as well. But um, it would be fairly risk-free because as I mentioned, it's a reimbursement rather than giving the money up front. So the, the loan part of it would be up to $25,000 and the term would vary from uh, 48 months to 60 months, depending on the amount of the loan. Um, since it is deferred uh, or it's a reimbursement, they would uh, not start making the payments on the loan until six months. So it would allow the, the project to be completed and then the final details would be uh, established. Um, 
it would have to be owner occupied, as I mentioned. And it, if they do have a loan, and at some point it no longer becomes the residence of the applicant or no longer <laughs> owner occupied, they would have to pay the loan back at that time. Um, but otherwise, we would have a deed restriction on the property to make sure it is owner occupied. As far as the grant, uh, most of the conditions would still be the same. Uh, it would be up to a ten thousand dollar matching grant, um, up to fifty for fifty percent, up to fifty percent of the project costs. Uh, it would have had to be a, a rental property to be eligible for a minimum of five years uh, prior to the application, and in this case, the uh, the uh, deed restriction would be in place for ten years. So those are the details as we have proposed them. I have had some people already contact me that have indicated some interest in using this uh, program. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a good news because some of the communities that we had talked to when we were working on this said it took a while to get some traction and get it up and running. So uh, we're positive, we're, we're hopeful that it'll be, have a positive impact immediately. Um, but we'll wait and see, I guess. Any questions? Okay, questions of Joe. Barb? None. Isaac? None. Robin? Robin, None. unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, both could a person manage to use both the grant and then the loan? Uh, yes, that we, we have set it up so that the property theoretically could qualify for both. Okay, thank you. So one property could qualify for both. Okay. Yes. I guess the, the, yep, sorry, go ahead. Do you want to say more about that? I was just say obviously the 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 amount of the improvements would have to be high enough to be eligible for for both okay and then i guess my other question is what has been the community response or assessment of that one hundred and fifty thousand dollar value is it going to be i i like the number i just wondered if it was going to be restrictive uh i have not heard any comments on that yet um that was kind of a challenge to be totally honest to come up with that amount because uh, affordable means different things to different people, depending on how you ask. So I, what I ended up doing is looking through uh, the federal government through HUD has a couple of programs, the uh, uh, home loan program and another one that the name escapes me that were for a similar type of a, uh, assistance for existing homes. And both of those values were in the 150 dollars to $155,000 range. And then WIDA also has a, a program for existing home purchase that also had a, a value of $150,000. So I, I think we have enough basis that if it was ever questioned, we were on solid ground as far as that amount being considered affordable. Um, but I guess my, my opinion would be is if you know, a year from now, if, if um, we're having issues with that amount that we could always reevaluate it at that time. Okay. Robin, does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and I like that. That's what I was thinking is we could always come back to it rather than opening it up too much and then just all of a sudden it's all gone and the people who really needed it didn't get a chance to get at it. So um, that's me. Okay. Jason. Just some clarifications on the house flipping um, scenario. So how it's set up is that um, if somebody wanted to buy a property, flip the house and then sell it, um, they have, are, are they on the hook then to repay that back? Cause it says owner occupied residence um, or how does that work with the house flipping again? Can you explain that? So, well, my assumption is that if somebody uh, takes the loan out, does the work and then sells it, they would probably take the proceeds of that sale to pay off the loan is what I'm assuming they would probably do. Uh, but otherwise, as long as the property is owner occupied, uh, when they do sell it, they would still be in compliance. And if they chose, they could continue to make the payments even though they don't own the property anymore. But 
I, I really don't see that happening. I think it would be cleared up at the time of the sale would be more logical. Okay. So then okay. would the would the person that's doing the, the house flipping be on the hook for the loan or would the people that buy the house have to pay it back then? Um, the person that's doing the work would obtain the loan and it would be their obligation. Okay. But the deed restriction would make it so that the property had to be owner occupied, whether it was the first owner, the second owner, or a third owner. Okay. Correct. Uh, okay. That makes sense then. Years, five years. It looks like five years for the loan, 10 years for the grant. Correct. Is that right, Joe? That's correct. Okay. I'd okay. Like, I have a comment. I would like to see it in there so that if the property is sold, and the, there's still a loan on it, whether this would be a owner occupied or a flipping situation, that the loan is paid back at the time of closing or the sale. Because if a seller, say a person that takes out the original loan decides to pack up move and is moved, I would say six states away, we could be in a spot where it's, it's tough to get that money back. Um, yeah, I could, that, that would be easy enough to make a requirement. We could add that to the development agreement. You would add it to the development agreement or you would add it here under home improvement loan and or rental conversion grant? That says uh, probably the, both. Yeah, if the property is sold, uh, then uh, the loan obligation, ha well, I guess it's not a grant. If it was a grant, it was a grant. The loan obligation has to be uh, satisfied at the time of the uh, sale. sale. Mm -hmm. So... Isaac, you're suggesting we add that in, and Joe, you can go ahead and yep. see that that's added in. Yep. Okay. Uh, Eileen, I think we're to you. Uh, just a clarification. So if uh, someone was flipping the property, I understand the loan should be repaid at the time they sell the property. It, uh, does that also happen with a grant? Um, it seems to me that if someone is flipping the property, it, I guess I wonder why it would be a grant. To me, it seems well, like if they're doing it to, to purchase it, to resell. Well, the, the, the grant is being provided to uh, encourage the conversion from a rental to an owner occupied. Mm -hmm. So okay. since it's a grant, it, it, it wouldn't have to be repaid, obviously. So they wouldn't get the money unless they do the project. So once they do the project, they're eligible to get the funds. And then the restriction on it would be the, the deed restriction regarding the, that it remains owner occupied. Okay, then I would add my comment, uh, can mention including potentially duplexes to the applications. Um, I am in favor of that. The more I think about this, especially with 1950, and older homes, if you start looking at some of the properties that are currently rented, there are quite a few that are older homes and they have been converted into duplexes. I think that if you look at young people who are looking to buy a first home and maybe don't have the money because they're making a college payment or their uh, debt payment, or they're having childcare or they're paying a car payment or they're paying rent, um, if they have the opportunity to buy something and they could get some money to convert it and rent out the other part to help pay. I think that's a win-win. I think it changes the neighborhood to where you have an owner occupied plus a, a renter. Um, or if a senior citizen wanted to buy it, that frees up the house of the senior citizen. The house is converted. The senior citizen lives in one half and a caregiver or somebody that rents the upstairs could take care of the lawn and snow removal. Um, so I, I, I way to look at our neighborhoods and say maybe this is a way to get people in there that wouldn't consider buying a home otherwise, but this would be a way for them to get into that first home. Well, I, I know that was uh, an idea that we did discuss. I remember having that conversation when Karen was here. And at that time, part of the concern we had was that we had a limited amount of funds available and um, we didn't want to dilute it, so to speak. So the idea was to let's just focus on single family at this point So since it was a limited pot and then um, we could always expand it 
in the future if there was still funds available and we weren't getting applications in. That was kind of the thinking at the time, but it's obviously up to the council. And I guess it, to me, it depends on who might actually apply for the grants and the loans. If we have people that would like to do that, could they be considered? I think that's a question. Right, that's up to the council. Right, got it. I mean, it, it would have to be included in these guidelines. Right. It right. currently is not included in the guidelines. That's Eileen, right. you were going to uh, look and see if there were guidelines you could find from Madison. Did you do that? I did, and unfortunately, I didn't get them until this morning. And I did ask Adam to send those out. Unfortunately, some of you may not have seen them. I didn't. See them. But they did allow um, rental and owner occupied. So you could have, in essence, a duplex. Um, they also were less restrictive in terms of other things about rehabbing, but they were also more restrictive in some ways. For example, they uh, recommended that no part of the property could be used for a commercial purpose, except something like a bed and breakfast. Uh, we haven't talked about that. I assume our zoning would address that anyway. Um, they also gave a longer time frame in some cases to repay the loan, but they also were allowing more money to be borrowed or granted. So, but definitely they, they viewed it as, I think without actually talking to the person because of the virus, they aren't in the office. Um, without actually talking to the person, I think the idea was that you, getting a rental property and having it improved and still having some rental property because there may be a lack of rental property. Um, and I know we may not feel we have a lack of rental property, but I think if you have a house think having that available to young folks or someone else is a plus compared to just apartment living. So if you take a, an older home and you convert it and you use half as rental still and owner occupied on one level, I think that also provides something that we're not providing otherwise. With this problem as it's now uh, laid out. Pardon? You cut out on the last sentence. Oh, with this plan as it's now cut out, by, by eliminating the opportunity for uh, duplexes, we're saying you can only buy a single family home and live in it yourself and get a grant or a loan to help rehab some of it. But if I look at some of the older homes, as I said, in the area that are now rentals, many of them have already been converted to duplexes. And if they could continue to be used that way for a while, I think that benefit to the people who are looking to buy something and just because they have other issues with income just could use that extra income to maybe allow them to purchase okay um uh, ken my question is um as far as uh, inspection of the house or home before Construction begins. Will the condi structural condition of the house be inspected? In other words, well, the, uh, whether it's um, in good enough condition to be receiving a grant or loan. The Where's, I view it as the primary reason due to the inspection prior to um, doing the project is just so we know that they haven't already done the project that they're asking money for. Mm. You so that you if they say they're going to change a furnace, we go and look at the furnace and realize it's an old furnace, and we can go back and see that it's a new furnace. We know the project was done as as requested. I, 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 I wouldn't view it as we're doing a property condition report to see what other work is needed and if there are any other code issues. But so that was be, not my intent. But the house needs to be inspected so that it is structurally sound to be worked on. There's some uh, record. Th that was not the intent of the inspection for this program. Well, I think it, it's still a, a question of whether or not the house is structurally sound. Well, uh, I have a question, uh, and maybe Isaac, I can ask you, is it, um, is it a general practice in this area to have a home inspection completed prior to a home purchase? It's getting more and more to be that way, especially if you're talking about the homes that we're targeting for this type of loan or grant. Most first-time homeowners 
of an older home, we'll say whether it's a one story or two story, are now, I should say now, but are, are doing the home inspections. I would say for what I've seen, it's probably 75% or higher are doing the inspections. So it would be possible, Joe, that uh, in this must apply within two years of purchasing property. And we could also maybe say, and provide copy of home inspection report. I don't know. Uh, I, I would think banks are beginning to ask for that, the home inspection report. I don't know. No, maybe they're not. not. Uh, banks aren't. No. And a home inspection is only going to get the inspector's opinion on things that should be done or will need to be done in a certain amount of time. He's not going to say that the home is um, not occupiable or should not be improved. He's just looking at it at that moment. Okay. So a home inspection report really doesn't help in this instance. Nope. Okay. And so can I don't know who would do an inspection that would certify, I'm looking for a word, certify that a home is structurally sound and should be approved. Our building inspector. A building inspector would do that. Mm -hmm. The city's building inspector would say whether the home is occupiable or should not be occupied. That's what I'm asking about, whether the building inspector for the city will take a look at the home before a grant or a loan is given. Uh, Joe, I, I mean, did you guys discuss that? I don't think it's a bad idea. Well, like I said, the, the intent was for it to be looked at beforehand. Um, I don't have an issue with that other than, you know, when you say that it, it's structurally sound, I, I would hate to, you know, place any kind of a liability on the city that's more or less guaranteeing the structural uh, stability of a, a home that when you can't see the inside of the walls and you can't necessarily see the floor joists and so forth that you're you're kind of hanging a, a, an approval on that that you can't really back up and you shouldn't be trying to back up would be my only concern. Okay. Any other comments on that? Well, I would hate to buy a house if I couldn't thoroughly inspect the house or have somebody else inspect it. And you can, if you buy a house, Ken, you can do that. Well, I think if the city is going to be loaning money and uh, giving out grants, they better look enough at the house to see how well it's constructed and whether it's in good condition enough yet to, to be uh, rehabbed. I think to the point prior that if we decide it's good enough to do the rehab, then they can also come back at us and say, you said it was good enough, now you pay for the part you missed. When, there, when there's some sort of problem that's found, are we on the hook because we did, we did the inspection? And my comment would be somewhat what Robin's saying is, this home improvement loan for up to the $25,000 is to make some of these homes that are dilapidated and are in poor condition into a nice home. Uh, $25,000 isn't gonna do all of it, but it's gonna take care of quite a bit of it. So this is where this money is supposed to go to is to help these homes that are in poor condition. Um, if they're in a great condition, don't eat things, that's not what this money's for, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I, I agree. Okay, any other, uh, Eileen, I hear your um, concern about no duplexes. Uh, this would be a program that would be adopted and likely reviewed. Um, are you comfortable with going as it is as an initial? Well, certainly I would be in favor of having a program. Given my preference, I would include duplexes, but definitely I'm in favor of the program. So I have just uh, off of what Eileen was talking about, just some clarification. So Joe, you had said like in terms of the um, discussion about um, duplexes was 
um, kind of went down to how much money is available t- for this program. Um, I don't know if this would create more work or what, but if it got to the point where, you know, money was getting used up and somebody wanted to do the, the duplex, but then it came down to somebody, somebody else wanting to do a different house, but then there wasn't enough funding. Would there be a way to, to kind of work that in terms of like who would get the funding or how that would work? <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I'm assuming we're not going to get all of the requests in at the same time. It's going to be the issue. So I, I think we will be in a position where we'll have to make some decisions on to a, whether or not we approve a request, you know, based on that actual request. Um, and we won't know who's going to be submitting future requests. I mean, obviously, I think if we had a bunch of them at one time, we could make some decisions on which one has priority over the others. But um, barring that, I think we're, it would be much easier to say these are the guidelines. Do they qualify or do they not? And then you make your approval based on that rather than trying to rank them it would be okay. easier. I, you know, I don't know. I think, I think we're going to have to put this program into effect in for a little while and then make some adjustments as needed. Mm-hmm. There's always going to be some things that come up that we didn't anticipate and um, problems or things that are working better or whatever the case is, we have to have some ability later to make some adjustments. And when we were talking to some of those communities, that was actually a common um, comment that we received is they, they did have to evaluate some of those after a period of time based on the response that they got. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Barb, I got a uh, comment here for you for what FHA, USDA, and HUD does on REO homes that they re- are, um, take back from a, um, a re- uh, foreclosure. So when a HUD or FHA property is put back onto the market by the government for the first cer- certain amount of days, whether it be 30, 60, or 90 days, that property can only be sold to a owner occupied property. If that property is not closed or sold to that person afterwards, then it can go into a investment property. So we could do something where we put a first standard timeline is the first year or whatever timeline is chosen, only single family homes could be used. And if the money is available afterwards, then it could be opened up to a single family or a duplex type property. I think that's reasonable. Eileen? Yeah, I like I like that. I could agree with that. I'm in favor. I just want to make a comment that since I only this is my second to last meeting, so I can talk. Um, my dad was a builder, and one of the things he said over and over again is you have to have rental income coming in to pay the taxes. And so, if anything, I would be promoting the duplex concept um, because Money's going to just fly when you're doing a remodeling. And I think most of you know that when you remodel property, one way or the other. And I think we need to look real positively toward a duplex concept for some of these homes when the time comes. Well, Isaac has made the uh, suggestion that we look at a timeline like if, uh, you know, We'll do this program for the first, I don't know, probably not 30, 60, or 90, maybe the first uh, 12 months. And then after 12, we'll uh, open the program and create some guidelines for adding duplexes. With one uh, one of the units being owner-occupied. Yep, with one unit being owner-occupied. It Mm -hmm. it still has to have an owner-occupied component. Yes. So just because I know the line has to be drawn somewhere, but there are some houses big enough that could be a triplex. Is that an absolutely no? Yeah, that's the slippery slope that we go down, isn't it? (laughs) I think we should stick with just duplexes for right now. Me too. Because I think uh, when you when you have a triplex, don't the rules change, Joe? And then you're not eligible for city garbage disposal and and there's, the, there's building codes are different. Um, and, and also, I would think going forward after the, the f- say, the five-year deed restriction expires, I think that 
type of a structure would be more likely to go back to a rental than a single family or a duplex would be. And, and remember our end goal is to get more single family owner occupied properties and to take some of these current situations that are rentals uh, and convert them back to family areas. So let's remember that that's, that's the end goal. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I'm just pointing it out, but I think the idea of being able to have, you know, an, your elderly parent living in another unit in the same building, I think that's something that we'd really like to encourage. So I'm completely on board for the duplex idea. I'm also for the duplex idea. I think when you go to um, a triplex, you have more parking issues. It just changes. It changes the neighborhood much more so than a duplex. Okay, so folks, uh, we've talked about this. Uh, the uh, uh, we'll get Joe to add the thing in. Uh, Isaac suggested about the uh, payment, immediate payment off of the loan, if if and yep. when the program the property is sold, uh, that would be for the loan. Of course, a grant would not be repaid. And do we want to then adopt this? How do we feel about adopting this for? Name amount, uh, do you want to adopt it for the next year? Do you wanna come back and revisit it, uh, implement it and revisit it after nine months? Give and uh, consider duplexes then. Um, it is 8.40, let's move along to decide what we're gonna do here. I'd like to see it for one year for single family and then after the one year, open it up to the duplex um, properties. I would agree with that. Okay, Isaac, are you making a motion to yep, I'll make it. Yep, adopt I'll make a motion. this um, program? Uh, Barb, Barb, excuse me, Barb, before we make that motion, sorry, Isaac, um, we're also being asked to know whether or not an appeal will go to the plan commission or the council. Was that still required, Joe? Did you still want us to do that? Yeah, it would be nice to have some direction on that. Um, if it goes to the plan commission, does it then still have to go to the council, or would the plan commission be the last word? Uh, I guess our, our <clears throat> excuse me, our thinking was staff would administer it, but then it would go to one or the other as an appeal, not both. So it would either be the plan commission and done, or to the council and done, okay. whichever you prefer. Pick one okay. and. Uh, I I believe that since this, my personal belief is. This was a program created by the council. It's the council that's been discussing it. It seems like the appeal should come to the council and because otherwise you're involving potentially uh, seven people who have no background in it. I don't have any problem with it going into the council. Sure. So Isaac, I apologize for interrupting oh, your- no uh, <laughs> Okay. So my motion would be to approve the home improvement loan program and to rental conversion grant program, which will be administered by staff committee with the appeals going to the full city council. Also having in there that on the loan, should the house or property be sold, the loan to be repaid at time of the sale. And for the first year, the home improvement loan to be considered only for single family residences. And then after the one year anniversary to be, if there's any money left over, for the home improvement loan to be opened up to one and two family properties with the idea that one unit must be owner occupied. Second. Okay, Isaac, thank you for your motion. Ken, um, thank you for your second. Do we need to repeat have a clear it? Yes, may I have a clarification? Um, you said the loan, but you didn't include the grant. Oh, I'm sorry, both. So the home improvement okay. loan and the rental conversion grant. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, do we need any further explanation? Candace. Nichols. Yes. Backhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Gillian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, I think we can move on to our next agenda item. 
County Market Street reconstruction. Howard, I think that's yours. I have Hi. unmuted you, and I see that Mr. Dresens is, Dresens is here from Delta 3, or maybe he's not here, but he's here. So, uh, Howard, you can take it away. Thank you. Um, this is contract 1-20 for Market Street reconstruction. It'll be a full street reconstruction to include water sewer, storm sewer, sidewalk, street, curb and gutter, the whole business. Um, uh, we conducted a bid opening on March 3rd. There were five bidders. The low bidder is GPRO Excavating with a bid as listed $764,099.20. Uh, of that amount, uh, I show uh, the amount for water and sewer and the amount for the city costs. Uh, we budgeted a total of $1.26 million uh, for this. Um, 152,000 in engineering, 1.1 million uh, for construction, and the low bid is well within the budgeted amount. And so staff is recommending award uh, to uh, GPRO construction at that bid price. Okay, question. Uh, Dan, do you have anything you wanna add at this time? No, nothing to add at this time. Okay, questions, Barb? Nothing, nothing to add. Adam or Isaac, pardon me. No, no. Robin? No. Uh, Jason? Nothing. Eileen? No. Ken? Anticipate at start of the project and completion date of the project before it, I'd like to see it done before the students come back. That's they don't come back to go to school, they, they probably need a place to live anyway. Right, right. Um, no, the plan is for them to be completed by the week before Labor Day, which is the week before they, the students come back. In preliminary um, conversations with G Pro Construction, uh, they would like to get started the first or second week in April because they are primarily gone. So they would like to get started early, as soon as possible. Thank you. Sounds good. And this is going to be replacing a four inch water main with a 12 inch? Correct. Right. Yes. And is the current water main, I see that it says something about it'll be a secondary feed out of the Furnace Street water tower. So is that a new kind of thing or is this current water main doing that too? It's new. Um, uh, this was a new add on. Uh, we extended uh, a secondary feed off of the water tower when we did the Furnace Street reconstruction a few years back in anticipation that when we do Market Street that we would connect it in uh, at that time. Okay, good. Okay, if there are no questions, I would take a motion. I move to work contract 120 Market Street reconstruction to GPRO excavating at the bid price of 754000 $99.20. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Ken and a second by Eileen to award this contract 1-20 for Market Street reconstruction to G Pro Excavating. We'll vote, Candace. Nichols? Yes. Dockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Fine? Yes. Yeah. Stanley? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, the last agenda item tonight is Aldi's. All right, I'm up. Um, so nothing, nothing's changed from when I presented this during uh, the last meeting, uh, but just to recap, uh, for the 2019 tax year, the city assessor sent out the 2019 notice of the personal property tax um, to include being sent to Aldi Incorporated on May 2nd, 2019. Uh, the notice provided Aldi with the total assessed value of the personal property and was based on the original settlement, excuse me, statement of personal property that was filed by Aldi in February of 2019. The notice also included the dates for the open book and board of review. No objection, objections to the assessed value were received by Accurate from Aldi to, at this time. The board of review convened for the year on May 1st, 2019 without any objections heard. Uh, then on June 10th, of 2019 accurate received an amended statement from 
Ryan Tax Compliance Service, LLC, on behalf of Aldi. This was 10 days after the board of review had adjourned for the year. Uh, accurate appraisal, appraisal did not amend the assessed value as the request was not received prior to the board of review. Um, and then uh, February 3rd of 2020, this year, uh, the city clerk's office received a letter from Ryan Tax Compliance Service, LLC, via post office mail containing a claim for $434.25 for unlawful taxes and requesting the claim to be accepted based on the amended statement of personal property and the exclusion of certain exempt machinery, equipment, and computer um, assets therein. The claim was received late as Wisconsin state statute states that such claims are to be filed by January 31st of the year in which the tax is paid. Furthermore, the claim was received via mail and not served to the clerk as required by statute. Uh, staff recommends that the council disallow the amended statement of per personal property tax for the tax year of 2019 to Aldi Incorporated and to not refund the amount of $434.25 on the basis that the claim was untimely, not properly served, and to allow the claim would be to set a precedent for amendments to assessments which are not filed within the allowed time period. Any questions? Questions, Barb? Well, I encourage this uh, chain, um, this motion because years ago we had a similar request from Farm and Fleet and we did not change. The assessed value at the time. Okay. Uh, Isaac, any questions? Oh, no questions. Robin? No questions. Jason? No questions. Eileen? No questions. Ken? No questions. And I have no questions. So the uh, recommendation of staff, uh, as Candace has noted, is to deny this. Uh, by all these for the unlawful tax claim for the tax year 2019. So do I hear any motions? I would move to disallow the claim against the city of Platteville due to the claim not being filed by the due date of January 31st, 2020 per Wisconsin state statute 74.35 paren 5 and A and not properly served to the city clerk. I would second. Okay, we have a motion by Eileen and a second by I, uh, Isaac to uh, move to disallow the claim. Uh, we will vote, Candace. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Boss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that ends the action items on our agenda tonight. We'll now move on to information and discussion. Um, and the first item on inter information and discussion is amendment to chapter six, animals. And uh, I'm going to start by calling on Adam. Yeah. Adam, I think that you had a meeting since the last time. And so perhaps you can report, I believe that was you, Robin, Joe and Mr. Winch. Then. So maybe yeah. you could report what happened and where we are. Yeah, so um, just to kind of update everybody again, this is on here for information purpose only. So there's not a vote tonight. Um, essentially what we are doing is continuing kind of the city's review of the animal ordinance. Um, and obviously uh, Mr. Winch has come to a couple of meetings and expressed concerns about kind of how some of the you know ordinances were created or some of the concerns that he specifically saw with what would happen if those ordinances went into effect. So we had a meeting uh, last Wednesday where it was obviously myself, uh, Director Carroll, uh, Council Member Klein and Dan and we all got together and kind of reviewed all of the concerns that he had. Um, you know one of the things we tried to do was show a little bit, uh, I put together kind of a quick synopsis of about six municipalities that all had similar um, population sizes from 2010 and kind of showed kind of the variances of what we saw and kind of what the planning commission did where you know some of them were very limited in what they would allow with it being two or three dogs some of them don't allow kennels even in residential Sorry, I didn't could you please? Um, 
So then what happened is in kind of those conversations, uh, Mr. Winch went over kind of some key concerns that he had in regards to um, how this would impact, you know, specifically his property that he has right now. Um, so what we asked him to do in that meeting was kind of put together a letter, which uh, you all should have got an email today that I sent out, uh, which really kind of labels out, you know, seven concerns um, specifically that he has in regards to, you know, the proposed ordinance and potentially what could happen to him in 2021 uh, when he goes to renew his private kennel license. Um, so you'll kind of see throughout the information that he gave, you know, each of the concerns kind of talks about specific sections within um, the, the ordinance. And we talked about how there was the potential, you know, opportunity to either change some of the verbiage in there or at least bring that to the council's life for discussion. Um, you know, one of them was specifically in regards to uh, how currently in the proposed changes, the veterinary clinic would be decided by the city. Um, you know, there was some concern about, you know, it, if the city selects somebody, we talked about how, you know, there's the view of could that be corruption if, if we have a veterinarian we prefer. We then argued the same thing where, you know, could somebody who's a kennel owner go to their buddy who's a veterinarian and get a, you know, signed order. So some of the proposals that we talked about was altering that language to have it be, you know, mutually agreed upon between both parties, um, those type of things. So there are seven things in there specifically that, you know, he had indicated that he had concerns with, you know, being the square footage, the decrease in dogs. Um, you know, the floor and the walls, how that, how that can be restrictive. And then what he did was put together kind of some proposed changes, um, you know, that he considered as options that we talked about, where it would be, you know, the potential, if grandfathering was a consideration, um, if we leave, you know, the ordinance as is, what impacts that has on his property. You know, there was discussion about potentially making some tweaks with the verbiage. And then also, you know, if he couldn't be grandfathered in, you know, would there be the consideration by the council to essentially allow him to have, um, you know, a 10 year window to you know, comply with these ordinances or make changes. So, um, that was kind of the, the general gist of the conversation. He put that obviously in writing for you and I made sure to send that to you so you guys all have copies of that. Um, he obviously I know is here in attendance tonight so you can kind of, um, you know, bring on any questions, but again, this is, this is kind of for informational purposes. So I wanted to make sure that all of you had that information um, and can kind of, you know, look into his concerns and continue as we all as a group continue to kind of consider, you know, which if there's changes we want to make to this ordinance or if it wants to be adopted as is, so. Okay, Robin, do you have anything you want to say about the meeting you were in attendance to? <laughs> um, well, on another note, because I'm having trouble with my email today, if you're able to quickly email that to my Gmail account, I would be able to pull that up while we're discussing. Um, as far as the discussion, um, I think it was just a very practical, useful kind of going bullet point by what um, issues uh, Mr. Rich was taking with the ordinance. Um, I guess we had some discussion about whether or not this would um, possibly get kicked back to the plan commission for further discussion. So I'm just putting that out there that that was mentioned as an option. Um, I think that Adam has hit most of what I have noted down. So I think I'll let it just go for further discussion and see if I see anything on my list that's missing uh after we've had him speak i guess so do you have anything you want to add no okay um mr winch we uh i i'm trying to find uh, i'm getting it someplace here i'm unmuted yep you're on you're unmuted uh before we go there um uh w most of us just got your uh, memo today in fact i didn't get it till this afternoon because just like others some of our email now seems to be delayed. So I'm not prepared to discuss it and I would prefer that you not read it. So right. if you have things to tell us that uh, are not in the memo that you wrote to the uh, city manager uh, or that are not, uh, that you, or if you believe that neither Adam nor Robin adequately um, talked about that meeting, go ahead. But I, I don't think any of us are prepared tonight after receiving this just today and not having a chance, had a chance to read it 
to uh, do anything with it tonight. But we thank so, you for uh, sending it. So do you have other things you'd like to say? Yes. Uh, first off, Dan Winch, 345 Bailey Avenue. Um, but yeah, um, as I am going through this, the, m the more I read it, the more I find things that are uh, needing to be changed. Specifically, um, if I look at the, the top line here, um, persons keeping or harboring or maintaining more than four dogs or cats would have to have this series of kennels. So in, in reading this more carefully, I realized that if a person has five or more cats, that that person would have to have a series of dog kennels in their backyard as it's written right now, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, obviously I welcome everyone and I, I would really hope that everyone would read that email that I sent out because it was very detailed. It did list a number of things. Um, one thing that um, it does not list is that we are now state certified as a kennel. Um, so I do believe that, that um, I guess should give uh, everyone a little bit of uh, encouragement that uh, what we are doing is definitely um, good not only for the animals but um, you know what's going on uh, it's all certified we've had obviously the health inspector the uh, building inspector the veterinarian everyone come out and obviously now the state uh, person as well uh, one thing I did ask in the last meeting we had uh, Robin had actually asked me um, to she said she was going to put the onus on me to find out uh, what an appropriate property size would be as the ordinance here is, it says 15,000 square feet uh, for the property plus an, uh, 3,000 for each animal. One thing I definitely wanted to make sure that I, I get to everyone, I personally do not feel that that, is an, that any square footage amount um, is, um, should be a hard requirement, um, but I did reach out to the state certification agent as well on this to see what the, what she thought. Um, and so her, and I asked her if I could quote her and she said yes. So her direct quote is, to give a hard line requirement on the amount of square footage required to operate a dog kennel without considering the number of dogs, the breed type, and the temperament is not logical. So I would, um, I guess, encourage this common council to um, send this back to the planning commission. Maybe we can get this to be a little bit more logical or maybe we can just find a way to you know grandfather us in or, or something of that nature but i certainly would uh encourage not you know uh, th this should not be something that we would move forward in, with and you know in the next meeting obviously this is an informational meeting but we should definitely look at this a little more closely before we would consider moving it on okay thank you for your input and um you know i think uh I don't know what other council members think, but I will say that I think uh, I will turn this back to Joe and Adam for uh, deciding. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, I mean, it's really up to you, Joe and Adam, if you think this should go back to the plan commission to be reworked, or if you think uh, we should attempt to rework this with the seven council members. So I'm going to turn that back to you. At the same time, I'm going to ask all council members to carefully read Mr. Winch's email and to send any comments that you have, whether they be, I agree with this, I don't agree with this, I question this, I wonder about that, any questions and stuff, I'm going to ask you to direct those to Adam so that he can collect any lingering questions, concerns? Yes, I believe this is good. No, I don't believe that is good. I don't understand this. But um, so let's direct those questions and comments to Adam. And Adam and Joe, perhaps you can tell us then uh, what you think. Uh, Barb, uh, do, you, uh, do you have further recommendation? I mean, I've now recommended as the council chair, we send it back to, we let Joe and Adam take care of it. Yeah, I'm going to abstain from this conversation. Okay. Um, so That's just fine. Hear that. Okay. Isaac? I have a question. Okay. Uh, regarding the, so regarding the veterinarian to be chosen, does the city currently have a contract with any particular veterinarian or kennel regarding, say, a stray dog, a stray cat that is currently found? 
So if a, if a dog is found, do we take it to a certain kennel now or? Yes, I believe we do. <laughs> yes, we do. We take it to uh, Platteville Vet. Okay, so this is just my opinion. If we already contracted through veterinarian for something on that line, we, I mean, it's, it's you know, we would not be, um, I, I believe the question was whether we're, um, uh, I can't remember exactly how, yeah, play in favor. We're already under contract with veterinarian. So I don't think that we'd be, you know, favoritism one way or the other. You just use a con the veterinarian that's contracted. Okay. That's just my opinion. Isaac, if I if I may comment on that. What uh, if Dan, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you not to comment while uh, city council people are commenting. Okay. Uh, so uh, Isaac, uh, your opinion about sending it back to oh, Adam sorry. and Joe? Yep. Correct. Same thing. Okay. Send it back to them. Let them decide where they should proceed to. Okay. Robin? I'm comfortable with that. Other, and do you have any other questions? Um, well, without seeing his email, I don't know. I, I just saw a couple other things he had addressed, but I'll put those in my list for things to refer to Adam. So. Sounds great. Thank you. Jason? Um, I agree with sending it back to Adam and Joe. Okay. Eileen? Uh, I agree also, and I have no questions. And Ken? I have not read the email, so I have no questions at this point. Okay. So then uh, the, the um, continuing the discussion about this animal ordinance will fall in the lap of uh, Adam and Joe, and they will uh, take our uh, comments. So Mr. Winch, thank you again for sending your comments uh, and your considerations. And council members, as noted today, many did not get it early enough to read it and comment on it. Uh, and so those comments will be sent to Adam. And I'd ask- When would you, you like those by? I was gonna say, let's see that those are, are to you, Adam, by, uh, by the end of the first week of April, April 3rd, our first meeting in April isn't until the 14th of April, but that will give them then time. If you get it, if you get anything to them, the sooner the better, of course, but mm -hmm. certainly by April 3rd. If there's a plan commission meeting in uh, April, it would be that first Monday, the 4th. And Joe, I don't know, I'm not even asking if that's going to be scheduled or what, but yeah. The sooner the better, but certainly by the end of next week, by April the 3rd. I can't even believe that next week's April the 3rd. <laughs> and, uh, and Adam and Joe will uh, look forward to hearing from you. And Mr. Winch, if you have additional comments, then I'm gonna ask you to also share them with Adam and he can share those with the rest of us. So uh, no action on this tonight and uh, no knowledge of whether this will be on the agenda or if it'll go back to the plan commission until there's some study by Adam and Joe. And so are we ready to move to the next agenda item? Yes. Yes. Okay. Adam, mm -hmm. city goals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as you guys will see in your packet, and again, this is just information items only. So we even despite with the massive work we continue to do with COVID-19 um, have also been working on the 2020 city goals. Uh, so what you can see is kind of the list of everything that's going through. And I guess what I'll do is, um, you know, it was in the pack and it was in the information. So if there's any specific questions on any of the goals that you want to talk about, I guess I'll just open it up to that. Um, and we'll kind of go that route, but otherwise they're in there and obviously you can review them. And if there's any further questions, please let me know and we'll get you further answers. But uh, it just really was kind of a synopsis of everything we have been working on kind of in the first uh, quarter here of 2020 in trying to hit some of the targets that we put together. Um, I have one question. Yeah. And that's on, on mine, on the infrastructure complete museum projects, there's a yellow highlight by Rock School Repair, Roof Repair slash Recode Bids are in review. Is that just because it was yellow or is that 
of special nope. note for some reason. Nope, at one point that was yellow and it did not get taken off of yellow. So that's all oh. that is. So there really, really no reason, right, Eric? I see you were there. I thought I would, yeah, okay. Any other questions about the goals? Well then, let us move on to contract 2020, Bradford and Irene. Uh, Howard. Okay, thank you. Um, Bradford Street uh, needs reconstruction. Irene from Bradford to Hickory Street also needs reconstruction. Um, in our budget, we only budgeted from, uh, from Pine Street to uh, Irene Street. We did. Uh, we left Pine to Maine as an alternate bid, uh, and so if there were sufficient funds, we would in recommend that be included. Uh, this is also a full re street reconstruction, curb gutter, water sewer, all that stuff. Uh, there were two bidders at our bid opening. Uh, low bidder is JI Construction. Um, when we uh, look at the budgets, the base bid was underneath our uh, budgeted amount. Um, when, uh, with all the rest of our projects being bid out, uh, we do have a spreadsheet that highlights uh, where we are with those. And we believe that uh, with under budget uh, projects already awarded, we would have enough uh, funding to do uh, Bradford Street to include the uh, alternate bid between Pine and Main Street. So we will be recommending the award of this contract to JI Excavating. Okay, uh, Dan, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, nothing to add. Um, I, if there's any questions about the budget sheet that Howard and I put together, just let us know. Um, we tried to break it out with all the different alternates and then also with the different funding sources. Um, specifically, this would be more of a water and sewer idea thing. It would be the Emmy Roth uh, reimbursement for half of the cost of the industry park uh, manhole replacement project. Okay. And that would feed into this and that therefore make, okay. Barb, do you have any questions on this uh, Bradford Street, Main to Irene Street? No, I don't. Now it would go main to Irene, right? Right. Uh, Correct. Howard main to Irene. So it would, in, uh, you're recommended yes. to in, include the alternate of main to Pine. Yeah. Correct. Okay. No questions, Barb? Correct. Uh, Isaac? No questions. Robin? No questions. Jason? No questions. Eileen? Call a start date. As soon as we start? Can. Pardon? As soon as we can. Okay. Great. Is uh, Ken any questions? Did I hear a question about the start? Yes, you did. Yeah. And what's the completion date? The uh, completion date is the same as for Market Street. It'll be completed one week prior to Labor Day. Okay. And um, Ken, has uh, JI Excavating done work for us before? Um, they have. They were actually a subcontractor of MZ Construction for the Washington Street project from 2012. Um, they were a sub, but they did the majority of the work. MZ just more or less was a, uh, a bonding uh, company for them. And uh, on the Washington Street project, um, it was completed on time and within budget. Um, they were, they did, a, they did a good job, so. Okay. Do they, do they hold their own bond now? They do. Okay. Um, the owner of JI Construction and the owner of MZ Construction are cousins. So back then they did a lot of work together to, because of the bonding. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Then this would be on for action at our April meeting which I think is, I think it's April 14th. 
It's a long time. Yeah. Okay. Um, next item on our agenda is the guest wireless network in Lincoln Park and the Family Aqua Aquatic Cent Center. And somewhere I saw Luke. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. So this is a request for additional funds for uh, the wireless guest network for the uh, Broski Center, uh, the Platteville Family Aquatic Center, and the uh, concession stand at Legion Park, because my cat climbs on my back. Um, the uh, council had previously approved a request um, of $3,600 for the Platteville Family Aquatic Center and the concession stand, but at that time, uh, I would say the Broski Center, the Legion Park Event Center wasn't uh, really, I don't want to say not on our radar, but we didn't think we'd be this far along. Um, but partway through that process, we realized that it would be best to kind of combine all those together. Um, technology has also changed a little bit in that time. Um, so this would be going to a, uh, uh, a cloud-based um, approach to the uh, guest network um, at all three facilities. Um, so some additional funding is needed. Um, because it is a new project, um, I would recommend park impact, impact fees be used for that additional uh, $3,600. Um, and that would, uh, the current balance in there is 36, or uh, yeah, $36,000 currently in there. All right, question. So this would take uh, the, the amend, uh, Nicola, this would take a budget amendment or is this, would this have to be amended or is this of the, amount that would be an internal thing well because it's using impact fees um that would not be a budgeted item so i don't think it needs a budget amendment oh, okay all right so then the request is to to uh authorize the expenditure of an six hundred dollars or thereabouts impact fees to provide uh cloud best based wireless to the broski center uh, at the same time that you're doing the Family Aquatic Center and action stand at Legion Park, right? It's the concession, okay. Correct. Not the concession stand at the Family Aquatic Center. Uh, correct. It would be at the concession stand at Legion Park, but it is an outdoor uh, antenna that would be going there. So it would provide broadcast for a uh, decent portion of the, uh, the park, especially around the ball fields. Okay. Oh, that was my question. There you go. Your question's answered, Barb. You wanted to know how far it went around the ball fields. That's for sure. Sometimes people get angry when they can't put their phone up and get that reception. So that was nice to know. Okay. Isaac, any questions? No questions. Robin? Questions? I was just going to ask, is there anything in the park impact fees uh, stipulations that it doesn't have to be physical improvements? Does Wi-Fi cost count? I, mean, I assume you've looked at that, but is there any wording that really addresses it? Um, no, I mean, the basic question with park impact fees is always, you have to be able to justify it based on an increase in population. So they're, they're paid in as new homes and new developments occur. So you just always have to be answer, you know, our population has grown. So now we need to do X, you know, we need, X new, it, it just can't be used to replace existing features or existing things within our park. Okay. Jason, any questions? No. Eileen, any questions? No. Ken, any questions? No questions. Okay, then this will be on the agenda for action at our next meeting. And then this ends the information and discussion time. I don't even know if we can have a work session, but we're gonna at least hear from Adam and perhaps Ryan about uh, the request for proposal fire department comprehensive analysis. Yeah, so this So I know that a... you've had some meetings. Yeah, so just to kind of continue updating everybody on this process. So we've had this on the agenda now for, for a couple of meetings. Um, and our intention is to continue to have it on the agenda and kind of figure out this, this process. Um, so the RFP, just to kind of summarize again, um, 
there's three specific firms that I reached out to that are very well known for kind of doing these types of requests for proposals. And they obviously gave me um, kind of a, a rough draft document to work off of, which was used from, it was the village of McFarland that was looking for kind of a public safety building that was their fire police and EMS. Um, so that was kind of the, the bones that started this RFP. Um, but really what it does is, uh, the RFP kind of looks at eight specific scopes of service and would give a particular, um, you know, consultant the ability to either give us a quote for doing everything at once, one through eight, or breaking it out compartmentally and looking at one through four, which really kind of focuses again on the 50,000 50, pie in the sky view of let's take a look at what do we think our fire department's going to look like in 50 years? You know, what is firefighting? Is it a regional approach? Is it paid on call? Is it full time? Um, you know, what equipment might they be using? Kind of looking at that. And then the scopes of service five through eight get really more into the nitty gritty approach of, okay, let's look at the current location the fire department is in. Does that meet the needs of being able to expand to, a, to accompany what we want? If we were going to move to a different location, what does that entail? You know, there's the conversation. We've had numerous conversations with people about the potential for it to be a combination fire station, training facility, and then potentially some type of commercial restaurant component, you know, thinking outside the box of just different kind of ideas that, that could support, you know, what this is. Um, so that again is just kind of what the RFP kind of looks into. We have kind of taken the time where um, I've obviously met with Ryan and I have met numerous times about this. We met with the group that is run by um, I think Deb and, and Bill, uh, who have kind of looked at you know they're the group that has a, an additional source of funding that would be supporting this RFP. They've kind of seen the bare bones of it. Um, Ryan and I were going to meet last week with the uh, all of the fire districts unfortunately due to actually not unfortunately but to make sure we were doing our best practices we did cancel that meeting sent them the rfp and asked them to kind of review the document and see if they had any concerns so they have till the end of the month to kind of give us any thought processes in regards to that um, i did meet with the fire department last night and kind of presented this proposal to them and it really asked you know they would definitely be involved in the process because we want to know their input in regards to um, you know, what concerns they would have. So whatever consultant would be selected as we move forward. Um, the response was, I think, very positive. They were encouraged that we're looking into this and, and kind of the overall concept we've all kind of took is, you know, the question we need to figure out is where do we need to go in the future and figure out what the dollar point is and really set a date and then start kind of chipping away at, you know, let's say if this proposal says a new fire station, yes, is needed, but it would be 10 years down the road okay, we lock in that 10 year date. And then our goal as kind of groups and organizations is to find out what we can do to chip away at that 10 years. Is it, you know, federal funding we can get? Is it state funding? Is it similar to what we're seeing with, you know, the Broski Center? Is there groups that would be interested in obviously donating? Um, I think those are all the things that we need to do and just kind of really reiterate, you know, really putting our, our full focus into this and seeing what we truly need as a comprehensive analysis and then kind of going from there. So I'll let Ryan kind of, Add, add anything if he thinks there's anything else he wants to add, but that's kind of the, the general update. We continue to kind of meet uh, with everybody and listen to issues, and that's continually why we have this on the agenda. Yeah, I think Adam pretty well covered most everything. You know, I, I think the big thing that's important with this is that it's going to give us a footprint to follow. You know, I, I think in the past there's been a couple other studies done, but there's never really been a foot, footprint kind of in place, you know, with that end goal, like Adam says, if it's 10 years, it's 10 years. Um, but this gives us hopefully a roadmap, you know, to get to, get to where we need to be. So, um, and, and I don't think there's really a way to, to keep moving forward unless we have this, this background analysis and study to, to have that information, to be able to make uh, decisions that some of this information I don't believe any of us are probably familiar with, and that's why we need these firms to be able to, to assist us with it. Okay, folks, uh, we've had this, the request for proposal document. Uh, Adam has now sent it to the fire district representatives. That would be the township reps. And uh, I'm assuming you also shared it with all the fire, de fire people. Yes. Uh, through some way. So we're getting feedback on this document. 
And uh, the goal then, I think, would be in April to put this RFP out and see what firms might uh, come back with uh, uh, an answer to that request for proposal. But I, uh, Adam, I'm, I'm going to again ask, uh, we, we talked about reaching out to the school district and to UWP and to the hospital. And so I know these are weird times, but... Uh, yeah, it's on my list. I know with, with that, it's been a little hard just getting them. But my intention is, yeah, before we would physically put this out to try to meet individually with all of those groups to get their input and buy in as well. Okay. All right. Does anybody on the council, Barb, any input you want to say about this fire? Uh, this Not at this uh, time. Not at this time. Isaac, anything? Not at this time. Robin? Eileen? No, not this time. Jason? No. And Ken? I talked already about location uh, at a previous meeting, so yep. I assume that'll come up at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. I think you're, you're probably right. It'll probably come up at the appropriate time. So I, I would say that uh, it's now been about two and a half hours. It's 930, and I don't know about you all, but I'm I'm getting tired. Um, as I say that, I want to again say thank you to all of you for doing this in this way. While I don't have a cat to comfort me, like Luke seems to have a cat now, <laughs> I did have somebody bring me a drink, which was nice. Uh, as we close this meeting, I would like to thank Adam too. Uh, I, uh, Eileen actually attended at, uh, physically, and last week I attended by phone a meeting that Adam convened that included representatives from the hospital, representatives from the school district, representatives from the university, um, representatives from Grant County, um, uh, that Grant, Grant County Health Department, I think, mm -hmm. uh, was that, and um, uh, other people from the city at, just to talk about the COVID-19 situation and how we might work together and what that might look like. And uh, I expect, Adam, that you'll do some follow-ups in the next week or the next week or two. Um, but I do want people to know that city staff have been working very diligently with people and uh, cooperating with each other uh, to uh, in these really incredibly extraordinary times. So thank you, Adam. Thanks to all of you, Nicola, Candace, Joel, Howard, Ryan, all the staff. I missed you, didn't I, Jody? I'm, I'm gonna miss someone when I do that, but thank you, thank you to all of you. Eric, for all you guys are doing to uh, help our residents here in this community. And as we sign off, I'm going to say a special thanks to Steve at the Clavel Journal and to Bennett at the TH for uh, helping to spread the word. And students, I hope you uh, uh, had a good time tonight listening to this meeting. <laughs> and Kayla, we'll look forward to working further with you. Um, uh, Jana, I don't, I don't know what you were here for, but uh, whatever you were here, Good, and Christina, keep up the good work at UWP, and we certainly hope that we do not have to use a resident hall on the UW Platteville campus for any overflow from our local hospital. We hope that we do enough in this community to prevent that. So with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. Candace will vote. Nichols? Nichols? Oh, she's muted. Is that mute? Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Doss? Yes. Gillian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. And now Nichols, she can speak. Nichols? Yes. <laughs> she muted <laughs> herself. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think my uh, my yeah, my little arrow moved over there on its own. <laughs> okay. <laughs>